Uh, so uh, thank you for the invitation. I was really happy to come to Riga. It's my first time here. Um, I have a very simple, simple job today, or a very simple question, to, uh, which I w would like to talk about. It's just the question of: Is consumer insolvency a beneficium, or should it be a right? So yesterday we had a great lecture. Uh, I had so many questions because it was really in, uh, very, very connected to my to my talk today. So we had a lecture where basically we were told how consumer credit is regulated on the side of making the contract and making the, 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 the rules about the contract. But there's another idea which is completely different. The other idea is, okay, maybe we should protect consumers on the other side. So when they are not able to repay the credit, because if you think very, very thoughtfully about the, the question, so if you regulate the contract itself, then basically what you are doing, you are protecting the creditors. The debtor at the end of the day is also a bit protected because he now you have the clause of how much he can take and so on. But if he, if he cannot repay the credit, then he has no Euro European Union directive, regulative way of protecting himself against a creditor who wants to get his payment done. So my question for, for, for today is the question of is consumer insolvency a beneficium or a right? It's also very appropriate to speak about this question in Riga because in 2015 there was a huge European Commission sponsored conference on this question and the Czech co Commissioner for, for Consumer Protection was here and sh she was having a speech about how European Union should do more about European uh, uh, consumer insolvency but then again nothing really happened in the last three years. Um, so there are some basic remarks which we have to go. The first one would be, I won't, I won't tell you anything new today. Actually, all I will tell you was already written. Here are the authors, so I'm just repeating what I already said. I guess it's easier for me to tell you what I wrote in 20 minutes than to read all the, all, all, all the works they have. But they are really nice works, so if you're into personal insolvency, you should read those, 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 uh, those, those persons. So. Um, the first thing is personal insolvency is not the same as consumer insolvency. So when we are talking about consumer insolvency, we mean that the debt occurred due to consumerism. So people were spending money to buy goods for themselves, not, not to, 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 to uh, pursue a business. So it's, it's, it's much different because we usually, it's easier for us to understand that, that people who are, you know, are entrepreneurs and they fail, and we usually let them to go into bankruptcy, but we are much harsher to people who, who are just, who spend it too much on good cars or, I don't know, to good wine. And the other question, which also you, you should have in mind, so personal insolvency is not the same as debt relief. But even though whenever we are speaking about personal insolvency or consumer insolvency, at the end of the day, we're always speaking about the debt relief, so at the end of the day, consumer goes into insolvency because he wants to be free of his debt. But even though this is not the same, so you should be careful, because the, the, the purpose of an insolvency procedure isn't debt relief by itself, but it is that the creditors would be paid in an in a, in a ordinary general matter. But even though uh, I, I haven't met a consumer yet who, who would, whose idea was, I, I want to go into, into insolvency because I want to pay everybody equal, so... Uh, so th that's uh, that, that's true. So don't forget about those guys. So nothing I'll show you is 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 my original idea. So uh, um, so the first question is why should we even allow people to get their debt relieved? So why, when, to whom, to what extent? So I'm always asking questions and I have no answers. That, that's 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 how I work. So. Uh, so the first, the first idea was, okay, maybe, maybe it's like a merciful model, which is now in Scandinavia. We have to help people who get into trouble. We don't want to, them to be homeless or without food or, or shelter. So we have to help them. That's why we allow this social force majeure. We allow them uh, to get their debt relief. The other one would be this U.S. market model, uh, which is the thing I was talking to. One idea is the fresh start theory. So people... Who, they, who just, I don't know, spend too much, they have the right to, 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 start, to start again. So basically, uh, Donald Trump went into bankruptcy. Nobody really blames him for that. Uh, and he's the president of the U.S. now, so it's nothing bad to go into personal bankruptcy in the States. Uh, I mean, um, and then you have this risk-bearer idea. This is just the, the idea I, I was speaking yesterday. So idea is, who should bear the risks if I'm unable to pay my credit? 
And in Europe, we usually say, of course, me, the debtor. I was the one who, who took the, the, the mortgage or the credit, so I'm the one who should pay. You know, the, the German year. We, I, I won't say it because I'm um, on Facebook. So, uh, but um, but the U.S. idea is okay. You got a credit, so there was a professional institution who should be able to assess the risk of you failing to repay. So if you fail to repay, it's not my problem anymore. It should be the problem of the creditor. So why should I protect those uh, uh, payday loan businesses with these limitations of credit? If I'm unable to repay, I just can easily go into insolvency and that's it. They won't get repaid. Their business model should fail at the end of the day. So th this is the idea about this US market model. Of course, the third one is the safeguard of one's dignity in consumer capitalism. You shouldn't fool yourself. The modern GDP or the modern idea of capital growth goes from the idea that consumers have to consume more than they are able to produce. So basically, we, we should take as much credit as possible so we spend it so the companies can work, so everything can grow and so on and so on. Huh? This is the idea. And of course, then the question, what happens when this spending goes too far and everything fails? Well, one idea is the debtors have to pay. The other idea is they can go into insolvency and the creditors are in the trouble. So this is the... And now this idea is, should be, should EU consumer, uh, should, uh, e should in consumer insolvency be part of the EU consumer policy? So if you have this consumer credit directive, etc., etc., so you have regulation on this end of the consumer contract, why don't you have a regulation on this side of, of the contract when something goes wrong? There's no good reason that the European Union doesn't have a unified, from the economic perspective, a unified minimalization directive on some basic rules of, of consumer, consumer insolvency. So my question is, why aren't we there yet? Why, are, why aren't we having a, a directive there? Uh, and it could be a part of consumer policy. So the question of, can European Union even do this? So is it, is it a part of its agenda? Yes, it is. It's, it's a consumer policy. So. Okay, so what are the benefits of a debt relief? So the first obvious one would be, okay, you're relieved of a hardship, okay? So the burden of not able to pay your debt is usually a huge burden. I mean, there are people who don't care, but a lot of people really care about the idea that they are not able to repay their debt. And the, thir the second one would be increased productivity. So if you don't worry each day how you repay your debt, y you are, you're more productive. And of course, it reduces the likelihood of individuals leaving the formal economy to avoid collective action. So if you know that whatever you legitimately earn, you have to give to your bank or to your creditors, then you'll work on the black market because there the money is yours. So one idea of how to minimize the black market would be due to, due to the idea of debt relief. Then again, you have the, a reduction in, exter in negative externalities from debt to families and to the state. So if you're, if you're not able to pay your debt and you have a mortgage on your house, you will usually pay the mortgage because you're afraid of losing your house, but you won't, I don't know, give your child new shoes and you won't pay, I don't know, certain things to the state. So the idea is why should the state bear the costs of your over indebtedness, why shouldn't the cost be bared by the, by the credits or by the bank who's a professional or by the payday loan companies, they're professionals. And of course, this is maybe counterintuitive, but it also creates incentives for responsible lending because if banks and payday loan companies know that you always have this possibility of personal bankruptcy, which would be very, like, very simply and easy to go to, then they would really have a good incentive not to give you the money if they are not sure that you will repay. Because they know if you're not able to repay, well then, you'll just go to, 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 the, to, the, to the nearest uh, courthouse and say, I want to have my debt relieved, I'll go into consumer insolvency, and that's it. That's the, that's the US uh, style of, of, you know, in the US, basically, it's really, really easy to, to go into personal bankruptcy. The only huge thing you can't get rid of is your... Uh, 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 student loans, um, of course. And of course, uh, responsible lending and the risk shifting to creditors is, is, is connected. So these are the benefits. But of course, if, if I tell you only the benefits, there must be some, some issues or some negative stuff about debt relief. So 
The first one would be, it's a very politically sensitive thing to do. It's really hard to be a politician and say, you know what, from now on your neighbor who was really driving a, a nice car and he was having nice dinners, but now he can go to a court and ask for that relief. So it's a political, very sensitive thing to say that consumer insolvency should be very liberal. That's why in Europe you have quite a huge uh, negative publicity about in, uh, consumer insolvency and countries are really reluctant to go into reforming the, the, the personal insolvency. There are no interest groups which would represent people who are insolvent. You don't have an insolvent party which will go to the elections and say from now on our only political issue is we want to have liberal consumer insolvency. So there is nobody who would represent the insolvent guys. Uh, and vice versa, you have all the banks and everybody else whose interest is that it stays as it is, so that, insolv so that in consumer insolvency is hard to achieve. I wrote it in really small, but it's a huge issue. It's moral hazard. What does it mean? It means that somehow people are sure that if you have a very liberal consumer insolvency possibility, you are in a moral hazard not to repay the credit. Why should I pay if I know I can go into insolvency? But the fact is that there was, especially in Europe, there is no real empirical research which would prove that there is any moral hazard happening in personal insolvency. None. There is none paper who would even be dealing with this question. There are some in the States, you, but the, states are, the United States are so extreme from a European perspective that we shouldn't be too scared about this moral hazard problem. People in Europe usually don't feel good not repaying their debts. Um, but, yeah, but then again, I know what you think. Uh, whenever there's a rich or a famous guy who goes into insolvency, uh, he's in every newspaper and the whole country goes berserk. There's no way he's having a yacht, but he's going into personal bankruptcy. So we have to prohibit somehow this from happening. Uh, and yeah, we have extremely limited empirical research within the European Union, why people go into personal insolvency, how they repay their debt, what happens after, after 10 years, do they repeat the same thing or do they don't. And so there's no, no evidence whatsoever uh, uh, in the European Union. So the issues are there, are in theory there, but nobody really knows what would happen in Europe if we would go into more uh, liberal way. So there are two basic models of, uh, of consumer insolvency or debt relief, whatever you call them. So the first one would be this straight liquidation bankruptcy. Basically you say, I cannot repay my debts, so the court, uh, so the court orders to sell all your, all your assets, uh, the credits the are paid out of your assets, and then you are free of, of any, any additional uh, debt and you can start, and you can start over. Um, don't forget, each legal system has, has a huge list of exempt assets. So these are the assets which cannot be foreclosed from your, from your possession. For example, clothes, minimum wage, etc., etc. United States are very famous for their household exemption, which basically means, okay, we can sell your house, but you have the right to, to, to take from your from the from the selling, I don't know, like 40,000 euros up to a million euros, okay? So they're very different within the Europe, within the United States, there are very different uh, uh, states which have very different ideas of to the what extent your personal assets are exempt from, 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 from being sold. And of course, usually only unsecured debts are, 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 uh, are, uh, are, are, um, um, forgotten usually mortgages and everything else of course it's the houses are sold within the personal insolvency so everything else is usually forgotten and the second approach is more an european style approach where you basically ha have to make a plan how much you will repay to your creditors for example minimum 20 percent minimum 30 percent minimum 40 percent and if you achieve this percent then your debt is relieved but if you don't achieve this percent then well god help you you're still in debt and you, your, your debt relief, uh, you won't be able to get your debt relief. So this is a more uh, European approach where somehow you have to show your good behavior and all your efforts to repay the creditors at least in a minimum amount. Okay, so these are the two basic models. Uh, this would be more a US model, this is more a, a European uh, model. 
So on the international level, uh, because we were speaking about fundamental rights, uh, there is no authoritative international scripts or books or whatever for addressing individual insolvency. There is no EU le leg legislative debate about uh, consumer insolvency within the EU. There is no influential national model such as, I don't know, for example, in the US Chapter 11 for corporate reorganization, which we could say, okay, this is a model, we should all strive for this model, and that's it. There is no universal model of, uh, of personal insolvency. And there are actually no really powerful professional groups uh, who would be promoting a specific model of insolvency, personal insolvency. So if you're a young researcher, this is great, because now you can start to work and propose a new model. So, uh, uh, but a lot of it is written, but there, is no real, there was no real debate. So on the EU level, until 2008, nobody really cared about personal uh, consumer insolvency. It was something like nobody re even knew this, is, this existed, maybe in the UK, but that was it. After 2008, there was a huge panic. You all know why, why, why it happened. But EU was making a panic about consumer insolvency, not because they were, they were considering the problems that the consumers had, but because they were considering the problems the banks will have because the consumers won't be repaying their debt. So the logic was vice versa. So EU didn't start to talk about consumer insolvency because of the consumer. They started to talk about, 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 about because they were afraid about the banks, so about the too big to fail uh, uh, companies. And then when Troika came in you know, a lot of countries, uh, you know, European Central Bank, uh, European Commission, IMF, one of, the, one of the things they were always saying to all those countries was you have to regulate your consumer insolvency. Spain, Greece, Lithuania. So everywhere they came, they said, you have to liberalize your consumer insolvency. And they had a lot of ideas how this should be, how this should be done. And of course, after 2008, there was a huge consumer insolvency movement in the European Union, especially to the question of household debt. Don't forget, uh, we, we have some people from Spain, they will, they will explain afterwards how, how the Troika was trying to explain to the Spain that it's not okay that after your houses are sold, you still don't get your debt relief, but you're still own whatever you're owned. So there was a huge debate, especially in Spain, and they were trying to make them to liberalize their policies. But no EU effort in the sense of a directive or recommendation was, was actually uh, uh, made. Um, so as I was saying, if you ask me, there's no good reason we don't have an EU consumer insolvency directive because we have some solutions on the one hand, but you have no solutions on the other hand. But you have to know, in economic theory, consumer bankruptcy is basically an ex-ante insurance policy for individuals to reduce the risks if something goes wrong. So as you have corporations which have their ex-ante uh, insurance in the idea that the, the, the shareholders aren't liable for the claims of the company, consumer in, in bankruptcy or insolvency basically makes the same thing for, 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 for natural, natural persons. So in economic theory, there is no real, real reason why you shouldn't do that. Uh, if you go through a lot of EU documents, I didn't want to, to, to put them on because it's, it's extremely boring to know all the numbers, but at the end of the day, cons in, uh, consumer over indebtedness the leitmotif in EU would be we need some insolvency and debt adjustment procedures which would prevent financial and social exclu exclusion. So even though in reality they were really afraid about what will happen to the banks, they had to write a nice statement. So we are afraid about what will happen to people, so we want to prevent financial and social exclusion of our consumers. Um, so EU is really not happy with the idea that we should have a swift discharge of debt in return for giving up, uh, up non-exempt property. So European Union is really not into this fast liquidation idea of consumer insolvency. They think that immediate discharge should only be reserved or happen to very poor individuals where we like know or predict that they will be not be able to, to make any real money in the future. So, so we should exempt them, but everybody else has to work towards redemption, so, so it's not as easy to go to a church, but you have to work to get your redemption done. Uh, and of course, they, they are always, the European Union generally is for, for some kind of repayment, repayment plans. Um, so 
what is the basic European idea of, uh, of, of designing a consumer insolvency? So you should have, or you should be able to have a fresh start uh, if you are a financially responsible individual. I really love this, uh, this financial responsible individual because at the end of the day, if you would be responsible, you wouldn't be insolvent. Uh, uh, you know, how you should be. So, but the idea is because we actually don't know why people get insolvent. So, is it due to this negative word of consumerism? Did they spend too much knowing that they will not be able to return, or did something happen to them? So, in the US, it's quite simple. They say, yeah, you know what? Our social or uh, network or uh, safety net isn't really okay in the United States. So, if you get ill, well, then you are in trouble. If you get unemployed, you're in trouble. Nobody really cares of you. Even if you get divorced, you are in trouble. But in EU, we, somehow, we always thought like traditionally, okay, if I get ill, no problem. <coughs> somehow the state will, will provide for me. Uh, they will also somehow give me some money, etc. If I get divorced, okay, no problem. Somehow the state will help me. If I, I don't know, get old, okay, I'll get a pension. So not a huge problem. And that's why... In Europe, we are still really baffling with this idea that sometimes things just go wrong. That even if you have this huge social net safety net, if you get ill, you might lose your ability to make as, as, as much money as you did before. So, so, so things can so things can happen. And we are really moralizing in the Europe about people who spend too much. We, somehow we can't get over this idea of moralizing and have a very negative uh, uh, view of people who are insolvent. So that's why the moral hazards should be very low in Europe, but also we always stick to this financial responsible individual. So we just don't want to give uh, a, a, a uh, Then we have, then also we, we need to have appropriate filing criteria to make insolvency procedures accessible to individual debtors while minimizing abuse. Again, we are afraid of some kind of abuse. Yeah, I will. And of course, okay, automatic stay and repayment. I had, I thought I had 40 minutes because you, you get, but I know I don't. Um, yeah. So my final, so my, my, my final question again would be, uh, is consumer insolvency procedure, uh, uh, should be considered as a consumer right? So from a, from a, a economic perspective, um, as we live in a, in a consumer, consumer economy, um, uh, if we want consumers to spend a lot of money and not to be too frightened to spend a lot of money, then you need to have a safety net, which can be called uh, a consumer, consumer uh, uh, insolvency. And of course, uh, a very important engine of growth uh, in the European Union is, is consumer spending. Uh, I, I won't show you, I, I, pr I prepared a, a, a graph of, of how much different uh, households within the European Union are indebted. So how high the, the consumer over indebtedness is in different states. And you could see, for example, that Slovenia, Latvia, and, uh, and Lithuania are among three countries where the households are, at are, are really not really, uh, are at least uh, indebted. So we, we are really declined. We don't want to have a lot of credit. And even though you, you, you have such, such really, really strict regulation on how people can 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 take additional uh, additional credits, which in economic sense makes no makes no 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 real sense. So if you if you ask me, it's really not fair to always be speaking about um, consumerism as something which we need, so so that our growth will continue on one hand, and the other hand, be have a, this double standard of, but when you are doing too much of consumerism, then you have no safety net. So that's why one of the ideas is that we should regulate also the other part of the same, of the same story. So that's it. Thank you.